Hi, I'm Don Stanhouse and I'm the Natural History Curator at Bolton Museum. And today we're standing in the grounds of Smithles Hall. But we're not going to be looking at the hall. What we're interested in is the habitats around the hall. So let's go and see what's here. There are a few different distinct habitats in um, the grounds at Smithles Hall and I'm standing at the, in, at the moment on one that's not of particular interest. It's mostly grass. There aren't many species of other plants. So it's a bit lacking in diversity, but it might be of interest for blackbirds who come and look for worms on it. And talking about worms, why don't we go over to the flower bed there and have a look at some. So, let's see what we've got. I was just going to say, we're not finding any worms and I've just found one. Now this to me looks as if it's probably going by the thickness of it and the length, I, I think that's probably Lumbricus terrestris, that's the common earthworm. So what I can use to identify earthworms is this excellent key which you can download from the Imperial College website and it was connected with a previous project called the Open Air Laboratory or Opal and you can see from this key it starts off with which description best matches your worm? Is the body long and relatively thin? Or B, long and relatively fat? Now, after having looked at lots of earthworms, I can say that's a relatively fat one, which immediately takes you to the lobworm, which is Lumbricus terrestris. And because it hasn't got a band on its body, which is called the clitellum, round there, you can tell it's a juvenile worm. What you shouldn't do with earthworms really is handle them for too long or stretch them. Because if you, if you pull them out, you can, you can damage them internally. And if you keep them too long in your hand, the heat is not good for them. So they need to be kept moist and cool. So you need to put them back as soon as you can. We've got a mother load of worms here. The green worm is more typically found, well, most of the green worms are, are, are pink but you do get green ones. Um, it's quite a stiff worm. Did you know that earthworms are hermaphrodites? Which means they're both sexes. So each one is a male and a female. And when they mate with each other, they lie the opposite way round. And then the male bit of one passes sperm to the other and they also produce an egg and when they've mated the a part of the body slides off and forms an egg cocoon which is about that sort of size and it's like a little tiny lemon and you can find them in the ground and that's got a baby worm inside it. Lots of animals like to eat earthworms and that includes badgers, foxes, blackbirds, moles, and there's also a worm that likes to eat earthworms and it's the New Zealand flatworm. And originally it was imported probably with plants quite a few years ago into various parts of the country. And now it's very common and it has a bad effect on the earthworm population in places where it's quite common. This is an approximation of the length a New Zealand flatworm can get to. So that will slide down an earthworm bottom and, and liquefy the earthworms in your garden. If you see one, terminate it, as they say. The flatworm is very recognisable because it's basically dark brown or black with a pale sort of yellowish edge and it tends to be tapered at both ends. And it can be quite large, it can grow up to about that sort of size but it's usually smaller and it has the habit also when it's resting of rolling itself up so it looks like a tiny Swiss roll. 
basically. So if you see a small yellowish thing rolled up, that'll be a resting um, flatworm, but the, the very, very recognizable. You can also find the cocoons of the flatworm under pieces of wood and you know logs and bricks, etc. And the little shiny black capsules and you should also get rid of them if you see them because um, the, 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 the flatworm's a bit of a menace really. The good thing is it doesn't survive in compost heaps because the, the, the temperature of the compost is too warm. So whereas a lot of worms like brandlings will survive quite happily in such places, the flatworm won't. So we need to have a bit more of a dig. Oh, there's a worm there. So put that in the tray. And you can see that's a completely different worm. It's got a very pink look to it. So if you followed this key, you would go past this, the, the, the thing about the fat worm and end up at this end of the key. And because the key, the, the, the worm has got a pinkish tinge, it's probably most likely to be one of these so it looks quite like the blue gray worm although it hasn't got a distinct yellow tail which means it's probably something similar um like the rosy tipped worm and if you look at it more carefully you see the head is usually rosy pink or pale pink up to the male paws and it has whitish pads and etc so that description basically matches this worm. So I think it's probably a rosy tip worm. <whistles> Certain species of worm will survive if you cut the end of the body off up to roughly a certain segment. But if you chop past that, it's gonna die. So they'll, they'll handle being cutting off or, or chopping off roughly to an extent, but um, there are limits. And as it happens, the brain and the heart and most of the other important stuff is in the front part of the body. The rest of it is mostly gut and muscles. And um, so suppose if you chop, chopped up the, 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 the front bit off, I think it, it can grow, uh, it can survive more easily than the back bit, if you know what I mean. If you, if you, chop, you chop this worm in half now, the front bit is more likely to survive than, than, than the, the back bit, because the back bit's got no heart or anything in it. It wor works more with flatworms. You know, the, the group of animals that the, the, the one I mentioned before lives is, is in, the um, New Zealand flatworm, that group of animals will um, survive more. You can get, you can get flat, people have got flatworms and cut them down the middle of the body. And one half of the body, the, like I said, the right hand half of the body has grown a new left half and the left half has grown a new right half. And the head has grown a new tail and vice versa. Or they split them down the middle and you get, them, get something with two heads. Um, it will heal up and it'll, the, the worm will like, they, 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 they can regenerate themselves to a much greater extent than an earthworm. And people have done all kinds of experiments with them. <whistles> the largest earthworm in the world is probably the Gippsland earthworm that lives in Australia, which measures about two meters in length. And there's also an African worth, earthworm, which is supposedly longer than that. Um, that's quite a big worm and another interesting, maybe towards slightly yucky thing is that in some parts of the world people eat earthworms and in one Asian country uh, they make them into pies apparently and in other places they turn them into steaks um, and I don't think that's going to be catching on anytime soon. Um, although I, th I'm, I think it's uh, a good thing for people to try um, different culinary experiences. And I'm an advocate of people eating insects, for example. And I think we'll all be doing that in the near future. 
they mate repeatedly, but they don't leave the burrow. Um, well, at least the large Lumbricus terrestris doesn't. The two earthworms will stay anchored in their own burrow and reach out um, in a loving embrace and then retire back to their burrow. And then they will do it again for long periods of time, repeatedly. Um, so that's an unusual thing to know about earthworms. Um, and they also live quite a long time. They live for, well, people have recorded them living for six years, um, which is probably a lot longer than you might expect one to live. I would have thought maybe a few months myself, um, but there you go. There are some factoids for you. We're standing in the woodland near Smiddles Hall and compared to the grassland that's near the hall, this is a much more interesting habitat. There's a lot of niches and there's a lot of variation in this, uh, in, in this woodland com compared to the grassland. There's lots of dead wood, dead leaves. There's a much greater diversity of plants. And one of the things you might want to do if you were looking at this, woodland as a, as a habitat if you're doing a study on it is to find out for example what trees are living in here and that is quite good at this time of year because you can identify trees without even having a leaf, a leaf to look at you know that you can identify them from the buds and as you can see at the moment we haven't got many leaves about this is Another useful resource, this is, these are from the Field Study Centre, by the way, Field Study Council. Um, that's a useful handout, a, a, well, fold out chart, and this is about three pounds. This is one for woodland plants. Very useful because depending on what plants are in the woodland, that will tell you also to a certain extent whether it's an ancient woodland or not because some plants will only live in ancient woodland so in an, in an ancient woodland for example you might find wild garlic ramsons um, and bluebells they're another indicator of an old woodland centipedes you might find that useful for looking under dead wood or under bark of dead wood um, not for the faint-hearted, I must admit. That's called the garlic snail. Ah, oh, it's a snail. Yeah, when you touch it, it gets irritated. It produces a chemical which smells of garlic. It's a sulphur compound. Right, so this is, I think, probably a white-lipped snail. As you can see, it's got a pale edge to the opening there, the operculum and it's stripy. There's two species that look like that, the brown-lipped and the white-lipped snail, and they have lots of different variations in the stripes, and they can go from almost completely unstriped to having numerous stripes. <coughs> so in this kind of woodland, you might see, for example, nuthatches, tree creepers, um, blue tits, great tits, um, woodpeckers, a whole variety of birds uh, that will uh, use this area. Undoubtedly lots of woodlice in this woodland um, and there are five species in particular which you'll find almost anywhere and you will definitely find most if not all of the five in this woodland including for example, example the common rough woodlice which is on the cover of this book Porcelio scaba. Let's turn this log over and see what we can find woodlouse wise. This looks like it could be the pygmy woodlouse. Yeah, but body coloured with reddish or purplish brown pigments, which do not fade in 70% alcohol, up to five millimetres length. Trichoniscus pusillus. Common pygmy woodlouse, one of the famous five very common species, which is what I just said a minute ago. So, 
you quite often find them in aggregations like that, so you find a, a hell of a lot of them in, in a damp space. They have to have damp. They can't survive in dry conditions. They typically underbark. Aniscus ocellus, which is one of the five common species, and you find this all over the place. Ah, beetle. That's a ground beetle, and it's quite a common one. That's uh, Plotinus assimilis, which right. is found under bark. You see that this is, this looks like it's been coughed up by a bird of prey, maybe an owl or something, and you see that there are fragments of bone in it, um, and it's mostly um, fur. So this is obviously an animal that preys on small mammals a lot. Um, so it's possibly an owl. Um, I'm not an expert on droppings like this or, or uh, uh, the, um, what's been copped up, up, up by uh, an animal, so I'm not sure, but it's probably an owl. It's mostly uh, rodent fur with the odd bone in it. One of the things you might want to do if you were investigating this woodland in any depth is to find out what beetles and other invertebrates are running about. And an easy way to do that is to put in a pitfall trap. So that's what I'm going to do with these tools now. So firstly, I'm going to dig a hole with this bonsai trowel. And what we want really is to Dig it about a, the same depth as this cup. And if you use cups like this, it's best to use X vending machine cups, say. So cups that have been used by somebody and thrown in a bin rather than just you going out and buying brand new cups. And because that's more environmentally friendly and you can use these quite a few times. Um, and we're going to use two of them together. So we dig the hole, just about the same depth as the cup. And ideally what you want is for the cup to be level with the soil surface. So Right, so now we'll pack in around the edges and you want it to be quite snug and you want it to be level with the surface around it so you don't want the cup to be standing up. And you also want it to be like the surface around it. So you don't want the ground to be bare in an area that's full of lots of stuff. So you want it to be pretty much the same. Right, so now I've done that, I can take that cup out and empty it. Although if I wanted to, if I wanted to make, keep uh, trap things in here that were alive, I might want to put something in the bottom. So I may want to leave a bit of soil or something else, as long as it's not long. I don't want, you wouldn't want a long stem sticking out of the cup like that, for example, because anything that could get, that's caught in here would be able to run out. So you don't want to have anything sticking out, but if you didn't want to kill anything, you could put a few bits, bits in there, so you might want to put a bit of sand in there or a bit of soil or a bit of gravel or something like that for things to hide in, because otherwise they might eat each other. So, but what people normally do is, if you were say an ecologist and you were doing a study on this woodland, is you'd put 
And this, is, this has been used before, that's why it's coloured. This is um, methanol. And I've, I've taken this from pitfall traps and sieved it so it's cleaner and I've reused it. So and you'd put a little bit in the bottom of the cup and then leave it in for say two weeks and then come back and take this cup out, empty it into a pot and then put the cup back in. So you not take if you if you took that cup out, um, if there was one cup in there and you took it out, the hole would collapse. Um, so it's easier if you just have two cups inside and you can do this numerous times. So you could you could do this over a period of a few months, just keep on emptying the cup out and putting another one in, putting it back in. And you'd record the location of the cup with a GPS. Um, this, so this Garmin, which I haven't switched on for, for, for now, but uh, obviously you would get, get a fix with a satellite and then you could tell somebody exactly where this trap is. And this size of trap is basically a standard trap for ecologists. There are variations. I know people who use bigger traps, but that is quite often the size people use. And basically a beetle will run along be completely unaware that there's a hole in the ground and then run off the edge into the cup. Um, and surprisingly, in the right place, you may actually catch hundreds of things over a, a period of time. Um, but one thing that you would not want to do is put a trap like that near a pond where you might get, you know, newts and froglets etc uh, moving around and falling in the trap so you'd put um, you'd either try and avoid using a trap in a situation like that or put a cover over it so you would put something over the top like some kind of mesh or something to prevent things falling in and it works with it you do the same thing for shrews and sand lizards etc you would you if you were thought there's a chance of things like that falling into the trap you'd put a cover over it because um, you don't want mammals and, and newts and things in the trap. You'd only want insects. So we've looked at a few things today while we've been at Smithles and we've talked about habitats. We've done some worm digging um, and we've had a look at the woodland and we put a pitfall trap in. And if you're interested in any of these things, you could try them at home. You could for example, go and dig in your flower bed and see what worms you can find and you can access free resources online to enable you to identify them. You can put the results into the earthworm site. Um, and if you wanted to find out what beetles uh, and other things are living in your garden, you could dig a pitfall trap in your flower bed or lawn or anywhere else that's suitable and put something in the bottom if you don't want them to the, the insects to um, to die and they will uh, be fine for a day or so and then you can come tip the soil or something out and into a plastic tray and then see what you found. So we're going to be doing similar sessions in the near future so keep an eye out for um, what's coming up next. When you've identified your worms, you can put the record in via the National Earthworm Recording Scheme. Eventually, the information will go to the National Biodiversity Network and your record will show as a dot on the map. If you click on that, you can see your record.